Hello, everyone. I'm Naya Swami Asha, and we're at part two of our, part three, actually, I believe, of our 26 keys to higher awareness. Greater awareness, higher awareness, something like that. I have to decide whether to do this like the 12 days of Christmas and at the beginning of everyone to recite through all 26 or not. We're only at number two, so it's not a test yet. But I am interested not only in doing these one by one, which is interesting by itself, but also just myself watching how he, he strung them together. Why of all the possible choices in the world did he choose these 26? Why in this order? Um, many times there's aspects of what Swami's doing that are not at all obvious until you dive into it deeply. Um, when this is being recorded, we just finished our Easter weekend. And on Saturday, uh, just before Easter, we revived a tradition that we used to have that we'd uh, unfortunately let lapse, but we are not going to let it lapse again, which is taking Swami's oratorio, which is the life of Christ in music, and uh, having a, a group, an, an all sing with that. Usually it's performed by a choir and soloists and instrumentalists, but there's the tradition of the Messiah where people come together and all sing it together. So we did the same with the oratorio. I'm bringing it up for this reason, that the first time we did this, which was probably 10 or 15 years ago, and in addition to singing all the songs, um, I also uh, we grouped them in three groups, and I, I commented on what the progression of the story was. And besides the obvious, that it progresses from the beginning to the end of Jesus' life. It was fascinating to, for me to see when you really looked at it, um, all the interwoven patterns that are there. You know, it's not as if Swamiji himself calculates. It's, it's very interesting. Mu much of what most people do, you would say it's mind-born. It's mental. The, its origin point is mental. You analyze something, you put the piece, you take the pieces apart and put them back together, and these are your conclusions. But I never saw Swamiji operate that way. He could often, um, in the most brilliant manner, you know, explain things on many different levels. But his way of moving through the world was much more just feeling it intuitively and then going with it. And then the patterns would reveal themselves afterwards in a very real sense. So oftentimes when I've uh, studied his writings, his books, many different things, the oratorio being one, I think these 26 keys is going to be another. Um, the pattern reveals itself as you yourself get into it. I was reading just interestingly, one of the more interesting books uh, of Swamiji's from the point of view of the construction and the writing is actually this one, The Revelations of Christ. This is not like the Bhagavad Gita book where Swamiji went verse by verse and uh, you know told you what each chapter and verse means. In this one, it's not really a commentary on the Bible per se in the same way. It's the, it's the whole revelation of Christ, and he just reorients us toward uh, what Christianity is and how do we understand it. And I had a, just the most interesting experience reading that book because it, it, I, I can only say it's a very intuitive book. It's not, it's, not, it's not a linear book. It doesn't by any means mean that it's not comprehensible by ordinary reason. But the underlying energy behind it is not linear. And when I was reading it um, the last time I read it, I've read it more than once, it was like I could feel there was an intuitive thread that Swami was following. And, the, and, and so the book, the book grew from the center outward in the same way that everything grows, every living thing grows from the center outward, you know, as, as uh, embryos, yes.
Let's see if they can hear you better now. Okay, I'm speaking. Shall I be testing it? I, I think it's better. Yeah, it's not frozen. Okay. Just as we as human beings grow from a center point out, the sperm and ovum come together and then everything expands from that point. So every living thing does. And so it was very interesting to me, and somehow it was most vivid in this book, although I think it's always true in his writing, that he followed a thread and then it just each uh, section of the book just kind of grew out of what was coming next. And it was, uh, in and of itself, it, it, it was very inspiring to feel that. It was sort of like I was stepping closer to the level of inspiration from which Swami wrote the book, which I think, now that I think about it, is what happens when um, you read and reread. That's what makes Scripture Scripture, is that uh, it isn't just an intellectual thing where you think about what the ideas are and get them straight. On a much deeper level, what you're trying to get back to is you're getting back to the source of inspiration. And if the source of inspiration is divine, the life of Jesus, the teachings of Krishna, or the expanded consciousness of someone like Swami Kriyananda, you can read and reread. And I believe that's why, as you do so, you understand ideas. You understand it on levels you didn't understand it before. Because of necessity, by the time the inspiration is brought down to the level of writing in a book, uh, it's, been, it's gone through many filters. And so the, the farther you can come back to reach that source, uh, then the more you're, you're directly perceiving um, what the, in, the first inspiration was. Many books have no level except the mental level. So you read them, entertaining novels and things like that, but there's no, there's no living... Um, presence for you to relate to. That's why I was thinking also sometimes reading and rereading the same books because 45 years ago I started and some of the books were published right at the very beginning. You actually really believe that sentences were not in there that have been inserted in the same book that you're reading and have read literally the same copy. But I think it's because uh, suddenly the revelation is there and you actually capture what it is. So um, all of that was talking about watching Swamiji unfold these 26 keys, and um, because I can, there are only two. I've only I'm only two into this. I can do the 12 days of Christmas thing here, and the very first one he says, which I of course spent all last week on, last session on, was be active, never passive in response to life's challenges. That's number one. I put these on little cards. Number two is. Exercise regularly with deep attention, <laughs> which is not exactly where I expected us to go. And in fact, um, I have them in my hand just to give you a preview. You probably ordered the document so you know. But the, number three and number four and number five are all about the physical body in one way or another also. So it's like he starts right in once he sets the premise. The first premise of this was that the characteristics of greatness are an abundance of energy and an expansiveness of awareness. So what we're trying to work for is an abundance of energy and an expansive awareness. So after we are active, never passive, in the face of life's challenges, now we have to exercise regularly with deep attention. And he says, physical exercise will not only help to keep the body fit, but it will also enliven the mind. So my first impulse was that, well, we're not going to spend a whole hour on this one. But I was reflecting on it more. We'll see. I'm, I'm prepared to go on, if necessary, from simple exercise. Number two is about the breath. Um, but there's actually quite a lot to say, and a certain amount to say that's interesting about why he immediately goes to the physical body. And what I started thinking about was the energization exercises. I believe the majority of people who are, uh, are and will watch this webinar um, are acquainted with Yogananda's teachings, um, and many of you I know practice the teachings. But I want to make this accessible for everyone, so I'll give enough background in case you're completely new to this, um, and try to also be interesting for those of you who are already practicing. Um, when Yogananda was asked by Swami Kriyananda if the um, message that he brought to the message of self-realization that Yogananda came from India to bring to America 
was a new religion because here it was in a Western country and especially at that time, the 30s, uh, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, uh, this was, uh, well, th this was completely unknown. So, and, and it brought together elements of spiritual understanding that just were not part of the Western tradition. And it was just still at the beginning, although Kriyananda was at the end of Yogananda's life, it was still the beginning of Yogananda's mission. And Swami, was, Swami Kriyananda was trying to get some clarity, so is this a new religion? Um, Jesus, for example, was just Judaism, and it didn't become Christianity until it was rejected by the Jews and then had to go to the Gentiles and then became an entirely different thing. So Swami asked Master, is this a new religion? And Master replied, it's a new expression which is really a very subtle point, because what he was saying was, among other things, how can you have a new infinite truth? Truth is always going to be the same, and by its very nature it's beyond time, it's beyond culture. But he did say it was a new expression. It's, an, it's a new way of putting the ancient truths, because this is Dwapar Yuga rising, this is a new age, um, new realities, new understandings are possible. But Master did make one original contribution, um, and, and not merely re-expressing and expanding, but one original contribution, and that was the energization exercises. Um, it, it, yoga postures are ancient. Meditation itself is ancient. Kriya Yoga, the fundamental teaching of the path of self-realization, as Master brought it, uh, Master said that uh, Jesus t Christ taught this to his disciples, and Krishna taught this, and it goes way back ancient in time because it's a fundamental reality of our inner nature, and it, it would be discovered by anyone who went deep enough. They would simply discover that this was waiting in there to be discovered. But the energization exercises were a specific technique that Master created for this age of energy. And when we're teaching people through the path of going to Kriya initiation, which is considered to be the completion of the um, formal techniques that Yogananda taught. Um, there are four steps of, of techniques. First you learn working with the breath. The second one you learn is the energization exercises. The third is tuning into the Om. And then the fourth is taking the Kriya initiation proper, which has to do with consciously moving the energy in the spine and through the chakras. Um, when we're teaching our beginning meditation courses, people come and they sit and we teach them the meditation posture and we teach them the relationship between the breath and consciousness, which will be what we'll talk about when we get to point number three in this particular series, or at least some about it. And then people sit in silence, concentrating at the spiritual eye, and watch the breath and interiorize their consciousness. And it nicely meets the picture that people have in their mind of what it means to meditate. And then if they wish to continue to deepen their practice or if, if Kriya initiation is their goal, course number two of the meditation spirit series is the energization exercises. And instead of sitting straight in silence, I mean, we, we do continue to practice the breath technique and everything about silent meditation. But we also put people on their feet and we have them do deep breathing and we have them move their arms up and down and we have them do this whole um, practice. It's about, when you finally learn it, it's about a 12-minute series of exercises um, that are critical to your successful understanding and practice of Kriya. But for many people it feels so physical it's really hard for them to understand how this relates to the, the silent practice of Kriya. And we joke among ourselves who have had to teach this meditation series a lot that class number one of part number two of the meditation series is always the trickiest when you have to get them from silent meditation to standing up and doing a double breath and expanding their arms and grasping how this is going to lead them directly into deep meditation. Now. For what we're talking about now, we're talking about greatness is expanded awareness and uh, uh, abundance of energy. So uh, 
the physical exercise that Swami says, exercise regularly with deep attention. So we can imagine somebody in the gym, you know, lifting their weights with deep attention, and that's a good idea. But the principle of the energization exercises, I believe, is what Swami is hinting at here. Because of the nature of this writing and this publication, he didn't go into it at length or even directly, but it's what he's hinting at. Because here is the reason why the energization exercises are, are so fundamental to the practice of meditation and why Master took the trouble to talk about them. Well, there were lots of reasons why he did. The biggest problem we have in life is we don't have control over our energy and our awareness is scattered all over the place, which is to say we have a lack of concentration. And so when people come to our meditation classes, for example, and we, we tell them to watch the breath and to sit and meditate, you know, there's a certain attrition rate between um, when they start, even between class one and class two, because people sit down to do it and all of a sudden, when you're not being distracted, you understand how little self-mastery we actually have. And the whole challenge of meditation is self-mastery which is not merely to be aware of any darn thing that comes running through your mind, but to be able to deeply direct your awareness with an abundance of energy, which is actually to say it the spiritual eye. But in everything that we do, that ability to master your energy is really the key difference between those who succeed and those who didn't. I have a young friend who you know, had a moderate interest in the spiritual path, but also had uh, ambitions in the world and was a little concerned that if became too involved in this kind of a practice that it would essentially distract him from his, uh, his real goals. And, you know, that was a, a valid question. So I asked him in return, what is the greatest obstacle that you yourself perceive to your success? And when he thought about it honestly for a moment, he said, myself. You know, my inability to work as hard as I should, to intuitively know what the right directions are to take, you know, all the things that you could say. Having emotions and fears interfere. So in other words, lack of self-mastery. If we can master all the different uh, flows of energy within us and direct them one pointedly toward what we perceive to be our desired goal, then that's more than half the battle because then we can concentrate and make happen what we want to have happen. Because even an abundance of energy won't help us if we can't direct it. So we have to have the awareness, so to speak, of how to direct it. Now, just dealing on the level of thought or even of spirit, it's a little bit hard to grasp. It's a little bit abstract. It's, even with the aid that we give people for meditation, like, you know, like watching the breath or listening to the Om or various others, still it's a little subtle to grasp. The body is much more accessible, isn't it? And it's just like we live in it, we're used to it. We, we know, you know, if I want this hand to go out here or pick up my cup and take a sip of water, unless there's something physiologically disturbed somewhere, I can generally just do it. I may not be able to stand on one foot for an hour and a half, but still it's it, we understand what we're doing with the physical body because we live in it all the time. Now, there's other levels, which I will get to later, but we live in it all the time. So it's a good place to start. I know Swamiji has, has other intentions here having to do with health and vitality, but it's also a very good place to start to train ourselves to become more aware of what's going on right within us and also to learn how to simply and directly generate more energy. If an abundance of energy is one of the characteristics that we're looking for, uh, for greatness and success, then we want to understand how to, how to I mean, assuming it is possible, and this is the, the whole principle of the energization exercises and self-realization itself. Master used to lecture in public and he would go like this and he would say, there's enough um, energy and a pinch of your flesh to keep the whole city of Chicago in electricity for a week. How he developed that exact relationship, I don't know. 
But the point is there. I mean, right within our physical bodies. Now, the principle of the energization exercises is this, that this whole universe is nothing but an energy universe. Um, this is a new age, and that new age is called Dwapara, which simply means the second age, and it's called the age of energy. Now, it's not like in this age there's more energy in creation than there is in earlier ages, because creation is always the same. But the consciousness, the overall level of consciousness on the planet is more attuned to the reality of energy. In the previous yuga, the, the age on this planet, called Kali Yuga, which means the dark, darker age, um, matter was the reality. People just saw things in terms of fixed, um, how, how, how they manifested. And religions were separate, and countries were separate, and cultures were separate, and people lived isolated, and energy was of a physical nature. That was the characteristics of Kali Yuga. In 1700, when the Yuga began to shift into Dwapara, that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, steam engines and everything that followed after that until now they say there's more computing power in your telephone than there was perhaps on the whole planet prior to that. I'm not sure what the one-to-one -one is, but it's something close to that. The computer that uh, powered the spaceships. It's, it's, it's ridiculous how quickly it's all shifted. Ridiculous in the sense of it's, it make, it's amazing. It's, it seems ridiculous that we could shift so fast, but we have. Because in this age, man's consciousness is able to perceive the reality of energy. So what we're doing with the energization exercises, there's a hint in the name, and uh, you can learn these exercises by contacting Ananda online. It's not hard to learn them. I'm not going to teach them here. I'm talking about the principle. Is that by the active use of our willpower, by being active and never passive in response to life's challenges, we can gain access to that energy. And that we actually have, right at our disposal, unlimited energy. And that the only obstacle to that is our not understanding how to ex access it. So what we do when we're doing the energization exercises is we're not only, or I should even say, we're not primarily exercising the physical body. What we're exercising is our capacity to energize the physical body. And what we're doing by understanding where energy comes in, it comes in through the medulla, how um, create through a process of tension and relaxation, through a process of using the breath. I'm not trying to be secretive because this is easy for you to learn. It's just that's not the entire subject of the session tonight. Um, we can begin to gain mastery over the energy that flows through our physical body, which is to say we can choose how much energy is going to flow. We can choose the direction of that energy. We can choose the quality of that energy, meaning that it can be um, you know, smooth and even and not uh, merely not tense or agitated. Many people are very energetic, but they're so tense and agitated that the energy just exhausts itself, and it's not really accessible for anything uh, productive. You, sometimes you see people like that. Uh, they have lots and lots of energy, but they can't direct it anywhere. So it, 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 it's, it's um, unfortunate. So what we learn in the principles of energization is that, and, and the effect of the energization exercises is also very interesting because it's very um, uh, beneficial for the physical body. Uh, it, it, that, that doing those exercises, that 12-minute series, at least once a day, um, it, it fulfills all sorts of subtle needs of the physical body, not only in terms of uh, actually stimulating every part of the body, um, detoxifying the body, um, and also toning and making it vital. Swami Kriyananda, I keep thinking my water's on that side. Swami Kriyananda was... Uh, well, actually, well, I'll, I'll go to the conclusion first, then I'll back up. 
in his life, in the years that we knew him, which was from the age of 40 on, um, he did not, he was not that physically active um, for reasons having to do with, primarily with arthritis in his hips. Uh, not for any other reason. He was extremely active in the sense of he was always doing things and he was very vital and he walked with a great deal of power and he had all this force, but he didn't do sports or anything like that during those years, although he did earlier. Um, but he was so strong. He would joke, he said the only exercise he would get would be pushing a pen across a piece of paper. And then later on he made a joke, um, lifting iron, which I guess means lifting weights. He said the only lifting iron he did was to wear his watch to bed at night. <laughs> and every time he would turn over, he would joke about that. But uh, I, I remember, this is a story told by a, a man who met him for the first time. Uh, this young man was from Australia. And his wife, an American, was very dedicated to Swami Kriyananda and Ananda. But her husband uh, was a little more skeptical, and she was just determined that she was going to get him engaged in this path. So they came to America, and she, uh, Swami Kriyananda was speaking at our Sacramento Center, as it was at that time. And he came, but he was determined to sit in the last row, and somehow things conspired, and they ended up right in the front row, which was not at all what he wanted to, where he wanted to be. And then Swami came out, and whatever years there, there were, there was a period of time when Swami carried more weight on his body. Um, he, he, never looked, um, uh, he never looked fat because he was so strong, but he carried a lot more weight on his body than he did later in his life. Uh, he was skinny when he was young, then there was a middle period, then he became skinny again in his old age. And uh, so he was standing up there, and my young Australian friend who was very fit wasn't at first impressed with this uh, man's uh, physical impression. And then Swami stood there and he said, um, and then he said essentially what I just said about getting no exercise at all except the energization exercises, which he had done faithfully and regularly for decades. And then he said, and just feel my muscle like this, which is a very unusual thing. I have never heard Swami I never even heard of Swami doing it until I heard this story. He never did it before or since. I think it was just for that one guy. He said, feel my muscles. And then he looks right at this Australian man and he made him come up in front and feel his muscle. And as my friend told the story, he said the last thing he wanted to do was to feel this man's muscle. He just, he couldn't, uh, he just didn't want to be in the, the center of attention. He didn't want to be standing in front of anyone, and he didn't want to have to comment on this man's muscle. So he, he touched it, it like this. And then my friend told me, he said, the word that came into his mind was, this man has muscles of steel. <laughs> and he said something to that effect. He felt comical in saying something so such a cliche. But he said that's what he felt, and then more than that, Swami transferred some consciousness to him, which was, of course, the whole point. Because he touched him like this, and he said he just felt this energy go all through him, which it completely disrupted his, his, his uh, normal mental process. And for the rest of the evening, he, he sat there in an, an altered state and a state of enormous receptivity to Swami, to this path, and afterwards became quite devoted. But the real point was how physically vital Swami's body was. Now, here is where I'm going to come to why I think Swami put this as number two of these 26. Even though theoretically, you know, we really are just beings of energy, the fact of the matter is we are extremely influenced by the condition of our physical body. And it is a, a real challenge as we age or if illness sets in, to be able to separate consciousness um, from, from the physical body. Um, so there's two reasons, I think, why Swami suggested it. One is, first, why he suggested exercise as being important, exercise with deep attention, is because it's a very accessible way to begin taking an active step into our own lives. Many of us, I know, started start or started 
onto the spiritual path, which ends up being you know, much more uh, subtle and involved by yoga postures or by an interest in diet. Now I come through the baby, American baby boomer generation and went all through the 60s and the 70s, but the beginning of that movement, we got interested in yoga postures, we got interested in organic health foods. Um, it was just this sort of thinking about what are we doing to ourselves? And even in the act of doing yoga postures and discovering this interior energy, of course it was a wholly different scene now. Now yoga postures can be just, you know, just stunningly physical. I, I mean by that just way over physical and the subtlety of it is lost in the aerobics of it. But for a lot of us, when we first started with yoga postures, it had the effect of centering us and then it opened a doorway to a more subtle energy. In other words, through the body, which is more familiar to us, we can begin to get the idea of how one thing influences another and by how, by a direct act of will on our part, we can do things that will also affect our consciousness. And the same is true for what we eat, and I think number four of these points or so is really about eating fresh and vital food, so I don't want to go there too long, but I remember discovering sort of what a difference it made, um, you know, what I was eating or what I wasn't. And Swamiji, it was, I started to say about Swamiji in his early life, Swamiji was a very active and very dynamic young man in a physical sense. Um, he played tennis, and especially he loved to ski. That was his favorite. He was also a very fast runner, he said. He didn't much go in for team sports, and sports in general wasn't his interest, but he was competent. Skiing was the one he enjoyed the most. He grew up in Europe. He went to school in Switzerland, and that was what was done. And he, he really loved skiing. When he was a monk at SRF, he, they, they used to go skiing. He used to take the other monks skiing, and it became one of the things that they did. Um, when Swamiji started Ananda uh, in the late 60s and so on, uh, I believe, and this is how he actually said it to me, it's more than my belief, whenever you start a, a new project, the energy has to be gathered from somewhere. That's a way of thinking about it. Think about how often in, in myths and legends and in the Bible and places, if somebody wants to uh, make something happen or get, or get a boon or a blessing from God, they go off and do penance, is what you call it in the West. In India, you call it tapasya, which means austerities. You do a lot of tapasya, and then you um, can get a boon. And the stories in India are told of you do these tapasyas, and then Lord Shiva comes, and he gives you this boon. And it's, it's very colorful the way it's told. But what, what tapasya really is, is that you... You, instead of dissipating your energy in a certain way, you draw that energy to a focus. And even by your um, deliberate concentration on, in, in a one-pointed way, you create magnetism that gives you more and more power to accomplish what you want. And yes, in fact, it does draw to you the uh, grace of God and the, the boon of the angels also. Um, and, and then there's, there's just some other, um, I could only call it a subtle dynamic. When uh, a, an Indian uh, teacher came to visit Ananda in the early years and we showed him what we were doing. When he was with Swamiji, he looked at Swamiji and said, You've done, you have done a lot of tapasya to create this, haven't you? Swamiji just said, yes. Meaning that the focus consciousness of one person making those kinds of sacrifices is required, and he was subtle enough to see it. He saw the manifestation of that tapasya all around. So for Swamiji, one of the ways he, he did that tapasya was he, he took the, the karma, so to speak, of, of what was required to bring it forward, and he took a lot of it through his body. And he, he specifically developed arthritis in both hips. And he just let that arthritis run for about 20 years. And he was uh, essentially crippled. In fact, when finally on the 20th, 
think it was after the 20th anniversary of Ananda, Swamiji had uh, hip replacements, one first one, then the other. After the second hip, hip replacement, he had a little t-shirt somebody gave him that said, hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> After the first one, or after the second one, he also had a t-shirt that said, Watch my smoke, meaning that now that he was going to be out of that pain, just see what happens. But he, as he said, had to carry Ananda, literally, on his own back, and it weighted down his hips. And then it reached um, sufficient magnetism of its own that was able to go forward. But you see, because of that um, physical debility, Swamiji was not able to, he, he, he did everything that he had to do without hesitation, which meant, you know, traveling and teaching and standing up for lectures and going out with people and everything. But there was always the undercurrent of the pain. Um, but he, he wasn't able, for example, to go skiing or anything like that or do anything of that nature. So a certain mindset developed within the community, a kind of peripherally, because Swami did not set the example of that kind of activity, that maybe it wasn't so um, central. And it was interesting, at some point in there, Swami had a, a dream. And in the dream, he said, a, a, a football team, a group of football players came to see him. And they were all big, strong, black American men. You know, the, the uh, American athletics is shifting over. It's almost like um, those people who want to be on that level of athletics are, 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 are incarnating in African-American bodies, uh, whether there's something inherently positive about it or whether it's just the, the appropriate cultural reality to make them great athletes, that's what's happening. So in his dream, a group of these people came to Swami. He didn't. There were no recognizable faces. And they just talked to him about the importance of physical exercise. And they also put it to Swamiji in this way, which was very interesting. The brain is a muscle. And if you don't exercise all the muscles of the body, then the brain too, as a muscle, will atrophy. And your very ability to be creative and a as a vehicle for your consciousness, it will begin to lose its vitality. And it was, it was interesting, and Swami made a very strong point of it because he wasn't able to demonstrate it in his life, except for the energization exercises, that it was vital that we recognize the importance of the physical body. Master had Swamiji run around for about half an hour every day. Just, you know, go out for a run. Master sent him out to run. Master also used to play tennis and was a very fast runner. You didn't, and, and in his younger days, he was very much into sports. When you read the book called Mejda, which was written by his younger brother, about their growing up in Calcutta, it's very interesting. The theme of sports runs all through that. Master organized sporting events. Master organized competitions. Master was excelled at, at sporting events, which you, you don't really think of that as being part of things, but it's one of the ways in which we can develop self-mastery, and it's one of the ways that we invest in the longevity and the vitality of our sojourn here in this body. Because if the body begins to function, it's misfunction. It's not at all that we can't overcome it because, in fact, consciousness is more powerful than the vehicle we use. But it sets up an unnecessary obstacle. And so if we can keep the body vital, especially from a very young age, and we need to train young people not merely you know, to uh, win prizes and be impressive, but to actually learn how to concentrate and use their physical form in the right way, to exercise regularly with deep attention so that it becomes a, an exercise in self-mastery. A friend of mine who was a world-class athlete, um, he, he, he came onto the spiritual path and shortly after lost interest in his athletic competition. But he lamented the irony of that because all through his athletic career he had been looking for what turned out to be the principles of the energization exercises. And he had been looking for a way to use his willpower to vitalize his body. 
because at the level at which he was competing, he said it, it really wasn't the physical differences between the, the men that made the difference. It was, it was something much more subtle that gave you the capacity to direct that energy and to use your willpower. And he, he intuitively knew that there was a method to that, that it wasn't just hit or miss. But shortly after he got onto the path of self-realization and learned the energization exercises and so on, simultaneously with that, the desire to compete athletically on the level that he'd been left him. But he, uh, he, he rued the fact that, that they didn't come together because he would have so enjoyed being able to do that. But from the point of view of most of us who are not really going for Olympic gold, uh, what we're wanting to be able to do is to not oversleep, um, you know, not feel the compulsion to overeat, and also to just get get the most out of this little machine that we can possibly get out of it. I uh, I I developed an interest in very healthy habits in my late teens, and genetically, I I feel that I've been gifted also. Um, but it's interesting to me. I always uh, thought of myself as being very healthy, which I do. But it occurred to me at some point, well, goodness, this very early awareness of the necessity to, to take very good care of this physical body, water, food, exercise, um, fresh air, and other things, uh, I realized must have been the effect of having had bad health in the past. Because, of course, if you have bad health, you, you recognize the fact that health is not automatic. And you become very attentive to, to what can I do to maximize this. So the benefits of physical exercise, just from that point of view, Master had the monks running around. It's also a very good idea if you're trying to exercise self-control. Um, the monks, of course, were celibate young men. And exercising that kind of self-control requires that you, you, you be able to really direct your energy. But what I've also discovered, and this is actually what put me in, into the most uh, serious exercise program that I have followed, and I've followed it for some 20 years now. Prior to that, I did various different things. Um, was quite simply that there's a very strong uh, physiological relationship between stress and emotions and physical exercise. Part of it is the deep rhythmic breathing um, that physical exercise um, induces in you. And next week we'll talk about about breath and its role in consciousness. But I, I discovered that stress builds up physiologically. And this is where we find ourselves um, subject to the physical body and thinking that we're having an emotional experience when it's being triggered by physical conditions. Those physical conditions may have been induced by emotional feelings, but then it becomes a vicious cycle. But if one can interrupt that cycle, and Master recommended, actually, that you exercise hard enough every day so that you break out into a sweat. I mean, that's, you know, that's a pretty solid amount of exercise. Of course, bodies are different and um, climates are different. But just that simple point, I mean, yes, it's very good for the body to break into a sweat every day, but because uh, it, it helps detoxify and various things that people can explain. Um, but uh, it also gives you an idea of what Master thought was important. And he wouldn't have said that if he didn't recognize it. And so this is where Swami is saying to us, you know, it'll not only keep the body fit, but it will also enliven the mind. Now, this is what I was going to say, the physiological element of stress. You know, stress is extremely confusing uh, because when we begin to feel stress, our judgment uh, is poor and our creativity is inhibited by the level of anxiety that we feel simultaneously in our uh, schools, especially here in California especially in the area of California where I live, we somehow imagine that the more stressed the children are, the better their education must be. And we fight this, to me, endlessly frustrating battle with the, the school that we have here. We have a 
Living Wisdom School, which is based on Swami's Education for Life method here in, in our colony in Palo Alto. Um, goes from four and a half years old through the eighth grade. And it's just a, a fabulous school. We've been here for 22 years, and our graduates uh, all tell us, you know, that the best schooling they ever had was at Living Wisdom School, and whatever success they had afterwards, they often lay at the feet of their years in our school. But sometimes parents get really confused. And the fact that the children are enjoying themselves so much makes the parents fearful that maybe they're not learning. I have asked parents, you know, you know, how good work, how much good work can you do when you're tense and afraid all the time? I mean, if you go to work every day and you're tense and afraid, how, how productive are you? But we imagine with children that if the pressure, you know, if they're not nervous, I even actually had one parent actually say to me, well, of course, you know, it's nice if they're in happy and enjoying themselves to the third or fourth grade, but after that they certainly have to be stressed if they're going to be learning anything. <sighs> okay? No, it's not true, but that's a whole other subject. But exercising regularly with deep attention is really one of those ways to just beat out the stress. I, I, uh, my, ex- my exercise of choice is swimming. I just It works for me, and the circumstances work really well for me where I happen to live. I have access to a pool that's very um, enjoyable for me to swim in. And the capacity to just get into the rhythmic breathing, and for me, um, I like, I swim with a snorkel, even though I'm just in a swimming pool and there's nothing to look at. And I'm able to just put my head down and I don't see any other people or have to relate to any other people. And since my life is very involved with people, it's very pleasant to have a little break from that. But where I just, and just push the body, and I don't, I don't push it very hard, but I pay attention to it, I feel it while it's moving, I uh, enjoy the flow of water, that really works for me. Um, I, I, I kind of enjoy the sound even of the water, just all of those little features, plus the rhythmic breathing, which is a really um, a, a vital way to calm ourselves down, plus the simple, physiological effect of running the system a little bit. Just think about it. Just think, when the body doesn't move and all we do is feed it and work at our computers and talk on our telephones and, you know, sit around and talk with people and then go to bed and then get up and do it again, I mean, energization marvelously breaks that cycle and just vitalizes every cell of your body, literally. But just think how sluggish it gets, what to speak of it gaining weight and various things like that. But just exactly, it just becomes so sluggish. They Medically, they say, if the effects of even, even a little bit of exercise could be put into a pill, it would be the most prescribed medicine in the world. Okay? So I found... And I, at the time that I started swimming, which was, you know, I might have been as long as 20 years ago. Hard to imagine, but it may have been. Close to it, okay? Um, I just started using it because I, I felt I had, I had more stress in my life than I wanted. Uh, it was during the time when Ananda was uh, undergoing 12 years of litigation, and I was in the middle of that litigation effort because the attorneys live here in Palo Alto and it was happening right in our living room, literally, and sometimes right up the street at the courthouse. So um, it was a tense time and I could feel that taking its effect. And I began to think of it in terms of I would throw myself into the swimming pool, (laughs) hurl myself into the pool. And I actually came to this point during that, during especially during the time when I first discovered it. Oh, I was also, I believe I was trying to work, I was working on my first book. And that was also a bit tense for me for various reasons. And I begin to feel that anxiety building in me. I had the freedom, thank you God, to stop what I was doing and I would just go throw myself into the swimming pool and just swim. Sometimes if it was, the season was right, I'd swim right here in our community where we have a smaller pool. But just doing that with the tension, and I, I'm impressed by the fact with deep attention, which is to just surrender to the movement, surrender to the breathing, 
and and let your world um, shrink in a sense to just that the feeling of that vitality running through you and the feeling of that breath running through you and then physiologically it would never build up that's what I began to figure out prior to that it would always build up in my life so something small today would be something medium tomorrow and then be something big by the end of the week and whether that manifested as oh my vertebrae are going out of adjustment I have a tension headache my you know I've my arm is sore, whatever, my shoulder hurts, whatever it might have been, I could interrupt that. And I could essentially, it was like meditation. I could could bring myself back to a physical neutral each time. And of course, there's the, well, there's a thousand other reasons. But the combination of understanding the energization exercises and doing the energization exercises, which is the perfect deep attention exercise, And then just taking that out with a little more vitality. Plus, you see, it began to train the willpower. I I swam and swim by the clock. And I became and am absolutely loyal to the minute. (laughs) I I used to swim for 45 minutes, but that I, I found that I got too bored. But if I swam for 30 minutes, I could maintain my interest. But I almost never, unless there's a special dispensation swim for 29 because it's the way to increase your energy it's an accessible way to increase your energy and to train your willpower and actually to train your awareness why do you want to quit at 29 why do you want to quit at 27 why are you always trying to just wiggle out of it why not just do it and the physical body there you have it now you have to find the right thing because this isn't about overdoing it. This isn't about, look how powerful I am. This isn't about how many pounds I can lift and how many repetitions of that or anything like that. It's not, you know, how big my muscles are getting. This is what we're really training is something far more lasting. And we also just really want to do a level of exercise that is sensible, you know, for what it is we're trying to accomplish. And, And it keeps the brain going. It keeps the brain strong, too, which is really exactly what we're trying to do here. A friend of mine commented once, um, isn't this interesting? For some reason tonight, my water is always on the left, and my subconscious mind is convinced that it's on the right. Isn't that weird? Every time I've gone for my cup, I go to the right first. It's never been over there. Who knows? Maybe I need to go throw myself in the swimming pool. (laughs) But in any a, a, a case, it also talks about, and, and Master talks about here, is enlivening the mind. And enlivening the mind, in, in, oh, this is what Swami was going, wanted to point out, and this, this was part of his dream of those football players who told him that he needed to tell us all to exercise. Um, he, he said, look at people who are not physically vital. And of course, there are exceptions to that. There are people who are just geniuses who don't even know they have bodies. A dear friend of mine who's brilliant told me, she's my own, my age, which is considerably old, older than 40 now, but she told me that she was literally 40, as she put it, before she noticed that she had a body. <laughs> and then she became quite intrigued by it and started learning about it and learned how to dress it and comb its hair and things like that. Because prior to that, she was so lost in her mind, she didn't actually know her body was there. And... Some geniuses are like that, and I've noticed that really dedicated musicians, for example, they just pass the time while they're not playing music, and then they go back and play music, and that's their only reality. But even a musician needs a physical body to play. You see, almost everything that we do requires some intercession of the physical body, and if you can't use your physical body or it doesn't respond, you're just making it a little bit harder. But I was talking about the mind. It's like the mind, the consciousness does come through this physical vehicle. And as I was saying earlier, the brain is just a muscle. I, I had an interesting observation once. Uh, I was giving a Sunday service at a Nanda village up near Grass Valley, and uh, the room was full, and when you're speaking as 
Swamiji trains us to speak, which is more in an intuitive flow. And that intuitive flow is not um, uh, only is not self-generated, but is in response to what is being co- pulled through you. I was explaining this to someone. It's it's there's a, a superconscious divine divine inspiration. You might say divine mother here, and then there's the people in front of you. And the only reason you're standing up there to speak is in order to be a transmitter for some divine inspiration. And even though the one speaking may be the the mouthpiece for it, it's actually the 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 power of it is what the audience in front of you is pulling. And so, without that magnetism in front of you, nothing can happen here. It, it, it nothing will happen. So I was in this room, and I the energy of the room. I was enjoying it and relating to it, not not so much the individuals but the energy. But there was a, a most interesting vibration in the far back corner. And I I I couldn't quite see and I didn't want to stop and see who was sitting there. I was just um, subliminally aware of a vibration back there. It turned out that a group of uh, mentally I don't know what the politically correct word is, but individuals whose whose brains had not developed fully who were adults but really still had more childlike mental capacities a group had come out they they did they went to different churches on sunday morning and today was ananda so it was a group of adults who had the, the mental capacity of of children who had been sitting there the whole time and so it just was a very very distinct and different vibration but here's what was fascinating to me I realized that their souls were exactly the same. There, there was nothing to say what state of evolution they had or who, what, you know, just what their reality was. But their brains didn't work. That's all. Their brains didn't work. So the full capacity of their intelligence and their awareness couldn't express because the machine was broken. And But as soon as they died, as soon as this body was over, the soul wasn't mentally disabled. There was no mental to be disabled. They were exactly the same. Just the vehicle didn't work. And oh my, I realized it's very important to keep the vehicle working, isn't it? It's very important to just do what you can to keep um, everything going as best it can. And then if God gives you the chance to be consciousness without a body that works so well, that's fine. Um, Kamala, uh, a very great disciple of Master, Kamala Silva, uh, she became, uh, she had Alzheimer's or some kind of age-related dementia at the end of her life. And uh, her mind simply didn't work. But her soul worked perfectly. <laughs> she was so in love with God. She she couldn't relate on an intellectual level to anything much. But everything that mattered was still still present. But that's what we're developing also. Because when we can use our minds and use our brains to behave really properly in this world and to respond to our karmic conditions in the right way and take advantage of the uh, potentiality of having this physical body, honor it properly, use it properly, care for it properly, then the whole possibility of the Incarnation will be fulfilled. And so point number two is exercise regularly and with deep attention. Okay, God bless you.